Welcome to um, Subauto Processing Tips. This is our third uh, kind of Coffee with Chesapeake little mini seminar that we're, we've are we been running this month. Uh, the first one we did was on side scan processing. And then last week, Harold did uh, working with bathymetry. And this week, we're going to do sub-bottom processing tips. And I can't go into detail in 45 minutes. This is usually a something we cover in a full day of our Chesapeake training courses. So we'll just cover some highlights and a few tips and tricks. So I'm going to assume you're already basically familiar with how SonarWiz works. So this is sort of an intermediate level uh, dive into sub-bottom processing. And at the end, uh, I've got a few little pieces of code that we've been working on for 7.7. .7. So right now we're, we're going to use 7.6, but we have uh, some cool stuff that are going into sub bottom processing in the next release. And I'm, I have a kind of an alpha version of it that we can play with. So uh, again, on June 10th, we did side scan processing and June 17th, we did bathymetric processing and then today's sub bottom processing. These recordings are available on our website. In fact, right now, if you go to chesapeaketech.com, they're right on the front page. So you can, if you missed one of these, you can go back and listen to the uh, broadcast again and they'll be available in our uh, webinar section, you know, even later. So what we're going to talk about today is how you get uh, pretty and sub bottom profiles here and uh, make some three-dimensional profiles like this and uh, give you some tips and tricks that I use when I'm processing data sets. So uh, the agenda is I'm going to go over some import settings that affect how your data works. Uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how speed of sound is used for sub-bottom processing in SonarWiz. Uh, it's a little bit different than side scan and in some ways kind of confusing to understand. So it's good to spend some moments on that. Then I've got a little presentation on how gains work. Uh, I've got a data set that uses a sparker and we're going to have to play around with those gains to really pull the, the data out. Um, how do you color and display bipolar data? So we've had lots of requests, even recently, about how to really tune the coloring in your uh, sub-bottom profile so that they look really nice. A little bit about creating reflectors. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to go into that in too much detail. It depends on how much time we have. And But I will have uh, some time at the end to show you some of our smart reflector tracking tool. Uh, what we're working on is a way to make it easier to do tracing of uh, lines. So instead of having to click, you know, every 10 pings, put a pen, a little pencil mark in, what we'd like ultimately to achieve is you can click once, uh, click on the other side of the same reflector, and then SonarWiz does the tracking for you. And it's coming along pretty well. So at least on uh, some of the data sets we have, it works great. And hoping that uh, we'll get that all polished for 7.7. .7. Another really useful tool that we've been working on is a multiple identification tool. And the purpose of this uh, will be apparent when we look at real data here in just a few minutes, where sometimes when you're tracing sub-bottom data, you get uh, multiples and harmonics and ringing in the water column. And it's kind of hard to tell what's real data and what is just a multiple or, or a harmonic of something you've already seen. So. Uh, we have this, uh, we're working on a tool. I don't think the user interface is uh, settled on yet, but I'll show you what we've been working with. And I think that's pretty neat. And then we'll have questions and answers. So the first thing I want to do is show you uh, where we're going to be working. So I have a data set from the US Geological Survey uh, that was collected in 2014 in Southeast Alaska. So we're down here where all the glaciers are in a fjord and this is a Chenega Bay. We've got some nice bathymetry. Uh, the original data set here had uh, probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 sub, sub bottom lines, uh, about 150 bathymetry lines to go with it. It was collected over several days. Uh, we're just gonna look at a subset of this data, but what's really interesting about it is in 1964, there was an earthquake in Alaska that caused this, uh, this is a glacial moraine. So the glaciers are now, they've retreated all the way back to here. But back in the 60s, they were closer to the, closer to the frontier. And during the earthquake, this moraine failed. And you can kind of see in this image uh, 
where the debris kind of washed out. And this caused a tsunami uh, that crossed the bay, went up the other side and destroyed uh, a village that was here. Um, and, but it had never really been deeply studied. So the, the USGS was in the bay uh, trying to understand exactly how far these tsunamis go and how much material it takes to cause a tsunami. So it was a pretty interesting uh, data set. So let's start with, um, so that's what we're gonna be working with. So I've set up a project here. I've got a uh, projection for Alaska. Uh, we're gonna be in UTM zone six north and we're pretty high, pretty high up. We're at 60 degrees north here. So the first thing uh, you wanna do when you're importing, so we're gonna be working with SegWi files. And the first thing I like to do when I'm dealing with SegWi files is use a program called SciC, which is free. You can download this. Um, to take a look at the headers, because we are going to have to figure out where the seismic data is at inside of the SegWi format. So SegWi has been around since the late 70s, and this file format was originally designed for uh, tapes, analog tapes. So the seismic ships in those days didn't have the digital storage that we have today, so everything was recorded in analog onto these tapes. And the file format has evolved for, I mean, this format is so old that we hadn't even settled on what floating point numbers were gonna be, uh, how we would write them in computers. So there's lots of options. And over, as you work with SegWi files, you'll find that things are in all kinds of weird places. So when we import a SegWi or a SegWi file, so we're gonna go to import sub bottom, there is a section down here called file type specific options. So here's our SegWi files and we go to SegWi here, and there's this kind of intimidating panel of options that you need to select. Where is the sensor depth stored? Where is the altitude? What? Where's the shot number? Where's the event number? Where's the heave? Do we have a, a kilometer point? Do we have channel numbers, source positions, etc.? So how do you figure all this stuff out? Uh, one way is to send an email to tech support at Chesapeake and we load your data up, and usually the first thing we do is open the file in SciC. And one of the cool things about this program is it has an option where you can take a look at the headers inside the file. And like here's the text header for one of our files that we're gonna use, and it's got some information in there. So the summary here says that there are 9,600 traces in here, there's 10,000 samples per trace. We can look at the trace headers, and this kind of helps us fill this stuff out. That's, you can see the byte numbers here, and those correspond to the byte numbers in these dropdowns. So the most important ones, um, let's see here, we need to know where the, where's the shot number gonna be. And here, if we step through the file, you can see on the left-hand side, these are, this is one ping, and it shows us the values. So here is the record number, and here's, a trace number within the record. This one's alternating zero to one, zero to one, which means that there's multiple channels in this data. So we can set down here for 13 to 16 uh, that there's gonna be multiple channels. So I, I happen to know that in this data set, they had two streamers. So they had a single sparker source. It was a 500 joule um, sparker from SIG. And then they had two long streamers behind the boat. So you could pick which streamer you want to listen to. I think they were testing a new and an old streamer to see which was more sensitive. There isn't a whole lot of, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of depth information. They didn't have a depth sensor on this, but sparkers are towed at the surface. So we know the source was at the surface and the uh, receiver was just a floating single channel um, uh, receiver. So that that was also at the surface. So we're, we can assume that that's, that's good. With a with a sub bottom system or anything mounted on an AUV, you would want to have some depth information. So there's a tip. Tip number one is get familiar with SciC, go download this program. And then when you're working with SegWi files, you can kind of peel off the information you need for SonarWiz right from there. So let's uh, let's bring these in. And then uh, I think all the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. The one you pick the channel you want to import. Uh, sometimes when you're collecting seg SegWi data or seismic data, you collect too much. 
and you wind up having just a lot of dead space at the bottom of your file, you can trim that off here uh, when you import it so you don't have to carry it around with you during processing. Um, we don't recommend using the bandpass filter at this point, so I, I usually just leave it off. So I'll pull that in. Okay, so this is coming in. One of these lines is kind of long. So there's our there's our data set. So let's get some context for this. So we've got three track lines in here. So we're gonna load a chart. So let's add a base map. I kind of prepped all this stuff before the presentation, so it'll all be here. So we've got a nautical chart. It's just complaining that I've already loaded it once. And let's load that bathymetry that we saw there. So we'll add a grid file. Now, there was a question a couple of weeks ago about what um, types of bathymetry we can bring in. And SonarWiz supports uh, all of these different formats, surfer grids, uh, global mapper, binary files, ESRI, uh, ASCII grids, USGS grids, ArcInfo, um, a whole bunch. And if there happens to be one that you don't, um, that isn't supported, another route is to create an XYZ file and then grid it. So we can grid an external XYZ file to get the uh, the bathy in. So here's our bathymetry. And uh, you can see this is, uh, here's the sill, the first sill here. And there are the, um, there's all kinds of slumps that have come off of this. There's another one here and another one here. These are places where the glacier stopped as it was retreating and piled up a moraine in front of it before it retreated some more. The uh, papers that were published on this uh, outline, the geologists who analyzed this kind of outlined some basins and sills and that sort of thing. And I digitized those as features. So we could load, we could load those as features. And I don't know if you, you know that you can do this, but you can import and export features from SonarWiz uh, all in a big batch. So we'll just bring all those in. The format is the SonarWiz ASCII file format. So bring those guys in. So now we have a little interpretation of uh, the data here. And I'm gonna put those into a new group here just so we have, keep them kind of organized separately because when we do analysis in sub-bottom, our reflectors also are features. So we need to keep things organized. So we can now turn those on and off if we want to see them or not. Okay, so we've got our files, we've got a chart, we've got our grid. Let's take a look at the data that we first pulled in. Um, okay, we'll double click this and open it up in the sub bottom analysis window. So uh, Sparker data is uh, if you're not familiar with what a sparker is, it is a long uh, electrical cable that has these uh, wicks at the end, and there's live wire exposed at the end, and a big brass uh, receiver up a little bit higher on the pole. And so what happens is electricity goes down the cable, it goes out those wires, and the electrical uh, shock comes back to the brass plug, and that creates the an explosion basically it vaporizes the water uh, all the way around that device which creates the signal and that of course is going in all directions it's everywhere and it's at all frequencies so sparker data um, it's a very lightweight source and it's easy to use on a on a vessel it does require a lot of electricity but uh, they're very lightweight but they produce a, a lot of kind of unwanted noise and you can see that here in this uh, data set where we've got a really strong surface uh, reverberation up here. And down around 200 to 300 meters, we've got um, that's our first bottom return. And all this stuff in here is kind of noisy data. So uh, we're going we're gonna to deal with all of that during this presentation. So the first thing I want to talk about um, 
is kind of just the, the overall display of seismic data in SonarWiz. So in newer versions of SonarWiz, um, if you select a file down here, there's a bunch of information in the properties window. And one thing you, you may have missed, if you scroll all the way down, um, we recently added the ability to control sound velocity. So by default, uh, SonarWiz has two built-in sound velocities. If you go up here to the properties in the advanced settings window, you'll see that there is a default water column sound velocity and it's 1500 meters per second, it's salt water, and a default sediment sound velocity of 1600 meters per second. SonarWiz, um, when you import a data set, it converts the time to a range using the sound velocity that's in the file. And if we look, uh, that, that was actually stored in the SegWi file. And if we look here, the sound velocity was 1500 meters per second. If a sound velocity is not in the file, then it uses the water column velocity that's here. Now, for every single one of these files, it'll tell you which one is in play here. And if you want to change that, you can do so. If you, if you don't like the water column sound velocity, if you have a better value than the default one, you can move it to custom. And it's, it's warning me now that if you make these changes, you need to do this before you do contacts. Uh, this should be done right when you first load the data in. But you can go in here and type in a different value. If, if this water was really cold, so maybe it was only 1490 was the speed of sound. And that would adjust uh, that, that file using 1490 meters per second. This is something that you can, uh, I think you can shift select uh, and apply them to all uh, the files at once, or you can copy it in using the make others like this. But that's, uh, that's the first thing to note about sound velocity. So if we switch it back to the file, it's gonna go back to 1500 meters per second, because when we imported it, that's what the default value was. Now, when you open up uh, SonarWiz, uh, in old versions of SonarWiz, we used to store sub-bottom data as a range. We would convert the time signal to a range, and then we would store it in the file. Uh, modern versions of SonarWiz store it as time, which is kind of the more proper way to do it. So if you go into annotations here and switch to milliseconds, this is really how the digitizer is working. In order for it to, to convert, so time is constant all the way down. And what you'd expect to see, you know, if we had a really sophisticated sound velocity profile, is you would have a sound velocity profile in the water, and then it would switch to a different sound velocity profile in the sediment. And currently, SonarWiz does not do that in the displays. It always uses the water column sound velocity. So this 700 milliseconds is accurate, but if we switch back to showing uh, meters, it's probably, so here, it's now saying 500 meters. It's probably only accurate, uh, it's approximately accurate down to the seabed. And the deeper you get in the seafloor, uh, the more uncertain we are about the sound velocity in the sediments. And um, you would really want to have a bore log or a well log in here that tells you what the sound velocity is. But the way SonarWiz works is everything that you see in this display, everything that you export, everything uses the sound velocity uh, of the water column with one exception, and that's when you're computing thicknesses, uh, the individual reflectors that you put in can have their own velocity. But I'll come back to that. Okay, so the first, so that's sound velocity. The next thing we wanna do is kind of clean up this data set. And I want to talk a little bit about how uh, the different filters work. So if we go into the uh, appearance tab and we go here to gain settings, there's a couple of filters that I tend to use a lot. Now for omnidirectional data like this, or when you have a uh, broadband source like a Boomer or a Sparker or an Airgun or something like this, it's your source, you're gonna wind up with a lot of this uh, low frequency noise that you'd like to eliminate. And we have a bandpass filter here. If you click this, you can turn it on and you gotta fill in these numbers. And I thought I would just spend a second to describe what those actually mean. So in, when you, a bandpass filter is just saying, we wanna let a certain amount of sound through and, and certain frequencies, but we wanna cut it off in others. And the way you, in the ideal world, so on the right-hand side here is a, is a plot where it shows 
we're gonna let sound through on this one, and then we want a solid cutoff, and we want nothing to come through that's past this cutoff frequency. And in the ideal world, in order to get this frequency response, we have to use in the time domain something called a sync function, which is, you'll remember back to uh, college, it's like the sine of x over x. And the problem with this, uh, this function, this curve, is that it goes on in infinite infinity in both directions, and it never goes to zero, which is great for math, but you can't do that in a computer. So down here, what's happened is that computers artificially cut it off. It's like, we're only gonna cut, calculate this curve out to here, and then we're gonna chop it off. And what happens to your time or your frequency domain is you wind up getting all these ringing artifacts in your data. So it's impossible to create a solid wall and in fact, what you get is all this ringing. And here you can see the sonar with signal, signal um, trace, this our spectrograph. And this is in a logarithmic scale, but I've, the clear window here is our pass band. So we wanna chop off everything below 500 Hertz and everything above 4,500 Hertz. And that the blue is the original signal, the red is the result of chopping that off using just a rectangular um, filter. And you can see all this ringing, all this bad data is still getting through. So there is a slightly better way to do this, kind of a workaround. And what you do is use what's called a windowed sync filter. So we've got our original sync, and then we multiply it by a, a window, a curve, uh, usually a Blackman filter or a Hamming window uh, is what you use. And when you multiply those things together, you get something that is very smooth, and that's not quite a sync filter, but it's close. And then your frequency response starts to look a lot better. And if you apply this information into SonarWiz, you'll get a nice clean filter here. So let me show you how that works with real data. So first go to the appearance tab and open up the spectrograph. And when you pass your so when you first open this up, it's in linear mode. So let's switch it under appearance to logarithmic. I think that's more useful. So when you pass your cursor along, in blue, we can see the histogram of our frequency. So here's everything below 10 hertz, 100 hertz, 1,000 kilohertz. So here we are. Now, if we want to turn on a bandpass filter, we click this button here. And now we can use our mouse to move that bandpass filter up and down. Now the default value is not very useful. So if we go from say 500, you can use this thing up here too. Let's say we go to 500 to 4,000. And then we pass down here, you'll notice it's not doing anything because the red value is the result. And the reason is up here. So we don't have enough taps and we don't have our window correct. So first of all, Really, Blackman is the only option. That you want to use either Blackman or Hamming for this. And so you can pick which one you want. They're pretty equivalent. Um, but you also need this, you also need more taps. And this uh, tap refers to the number of convolutions we're going to do. It's kind of complicated and I don't want to get into it too much. But basically, if your filter's not working and you see everything red, you just need to increase this number, probably by a lot. If we change it to 10, now you can start to see it's starting to affect more, 50. Now it's really working. There's just a little bit left. Um, you can set it to 100 and it's probably all gone. The narrower your band pass is, your pass band in here, the more taps it's gonna take to create your filter. And you can go up to 32,000 in SonarWiz. This doesn't, it used to be really a performance problem, but with modern computers, it doesn't make much difference. So you can jack this number up to 500 or whatever, as much as you need. Um, but let's see how this works. If we hit a, apply, we're gonna try to eliminate this low frequency interference that we were getting and see what passes through. Okay, it's still retrying. Now we've cleaned it up a lot. So we got rid of most of that uh, noise and now we're just seeing signal bet. 
So that's a quick, how, how does a bandpass filter work? The next thing I wanna talk about are gains. So in order to do gaining, we need to do uh, a bottom track. So let me, uh, I'm gonna turn this thing off for a second. So we're gonna use a bottom tracker here and I assume you know how to use this. So I've got some numbers from a previous run. And that looked pretty good. It's a little choppy in here. Sometimes with the bottom tracker, if it gets, if it's penetrating too much, you need to lower the threshold. But uh, this particular data set has such a huge elevation range that it's hard to get a single set of numbers that works for the whole thing. So we've got, didn't quite do perfect here, so I'm just gonna manually clean that up. I think that'll do. Let's see if there's anything else that was messed up. Nope, a few more. Okay, the reason we wanna pick the bottom is I like to do an AGC filter or automatic gain control that starts at the bottom. And there we go, so we've, we've tracked this. Gonna delete that a little bit more. There, all right, I'm pretty satisfied with that. So let's go into the gain. Uh, so we'll go to appearance again, and we'll save the bottom track. Go to gains. And now, oh, when I hit the apply using the spectrograph, it set the bandpass filter up for me. So that's how I recommend you use the bandpass filters. Don't use this button, do it with the spectrograph so you can see what you're doing. So the next thing we want to do is hit this AGC button. And we've got two sliders on this. Uh, the number of samples, the window size, and the intensity target that we're headed for. Um, the default values are okay for now. And we're gonna, inst you have this apply gain starting at Denier, and there's two options. Start at time zero, which would be up here, and it would be gaining up uh, information in the water column, or you can do it from the detected seafloor, which is what I would like. So we'll hit apply there. Well, that is working. Let me explain what an AGC filter actually does. So in this chart, this imagine this was, um, this isn't slant range here. So really it's, the whole thing should be rotated so it's going down. This is more like for what you'd see on a side scan. And then you've got your intensity. So intensity starts off at zero, it spikes up and then it fades off. What AGC, what we want is a target intensity that's pretty flat across the whole ping. So it doesn't fade away as you get further away, that time varying gain. So the way an AGC filter actually works is you create a window that smooths along this curve and computes the average value of that curve. So that's this thing. So now we've got this average value here. And then we're gonna compute the difference between the average value and our target intensity. Once we've computed that number, we can subtract the delta from our raw signal and that leaves us with a basically a flattened curve that still preserves the little wiggles, that's the shadows and the, the positive and the negatives in our signal, but removes this, this low uh, frequency curve. And so when it's too bright near the sonar and not bright enough as you get further away, and that's how AGC actually works. So your end result is pretty close to the target intensity. So if we look here, it's like, oh, that thing doesn't look so hot. So what we need to do is go in there and fix our color window. So AGC is changing the default gains. That brings me to a second thing I wanted to, to talk about, and that is with bipolar data, what do we mean by bipolar and how do you color uh, sonar with for it? So when you have uh, raw pressure data like this, where, which created with a shock, an explosion in the water or some kind of cavitation, you have both positive and negative pressure waves. And those are, those as they propagate through the water, they're received by your receiver as both positive and negative voltages. And 
here is the result of that. If you make a histogram of that, you have both positive and negative, and you want them centered around zero. Uh, that's all done during acquisition. And SonarWiz has this bipolar mode that allows you to color the positive and the negative uh, tails of that distribution differently. So if you if we scale this thing a little bit different, let's pull it out. You see it's kind of symmetrical. I want to pull these guys off because of the we've only done um, let's pull this. Sometimes getting this just right is tricky. Spread it out a little more. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is we have this distribution here that the AGC algorithm has created, and we want to kind of set it so that we can see the actual um, see the actual features without having all the noise amplified as well. And it is it's almost like well, I think our AGC is a little strong. Let's turn it down a little. So. We can change the, I'm going to increase the window size a little bit and decrease the intensity. There we go. Now, when you're using bipolar data, you have a choice of whether you see the positive or the negative wave, or you can see the full envelope. If we zoom in on this, when this is done here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. But you want to make sure you've got a color palette that's symmetrical about zero. So here we want zero to be white, and we want the positive numbers to be, say, the positive numbers are going to be black, and the negative numbers here are going to be kind of this uh, yellow color. And if we go into If we go into um, your preferences, you have you can display the full wave here, or we can display only the negative numbers, which would be only the yellow ones. Or we can display just the positive ones, which would be all the black ones. Sometimes that can make a difference in whether you see uh, the features you're looking for or not. So here's just the positive, and we can see more of the data here. And you can see these nice glacial uh, features down here at the bottom. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you, um, so basically when you're coloring this stuff, you can control that in the preferences about which, uh, whether you're seeing the full wave or not. And then here you wanna pick a, a symmetrical color ramp. And we have a few of them uh, built in. So you can tell they have a nice, usually a white center or a dark center. So there's a seismic profile if you like that one. Um, we have some that look uh, like here's a, I called a boomer color map. It kind of looks like a fish finder this way. Um, this is my personal preferences for this guy. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, um, still not real happy with this game. I managed to pick a value that's not great. I think for the, I'm just gonna turn it off for a moment. So I want you to be able to see this. So with the preferences in here, there's a couple of controls here that control how your vertical and your horizontal scaling is gonna work. And by default, it shows every single ping in the horizontal and it downsamples your vertical scale to 10, 24 pixels. Now, with this data set, when we looked at PsiC, we could tell that those original pings had 10,000 samples from the top to the bottom. 
and I'm having all kinds of problems with the coloring right now. Problem is the uh, yeah, it's looking better. There. So back to the vertical and horizontal scale. So originally when we recorded this data, it had 10,000 samples. And when Sonar was imports sub-bottom data, it preserves all of that data. Unlike side scan, it does not downsample the data. So we have 10,000 samples available to us, but what we display in our images is controlled by the preferences. So here is the vertical image resolution. And if we set this, you know, if you take, uh, 10,000 divided by 750 meters, you wind up with about seven centimeters per, per sample. So if you want to, for example, to display things, say five to one, you could do something like this, where you set the horizontal resolution, the number of pings you want to see in the horizontal, and the vertical resolution. And that will change your profile to show you the, the correct ratio or vertical exaggeration that you want. So we zoom out a little bit. So the next thing I wanted to show you is uh, often the next step in processing a sub-bottom data, once you get a uh, profile that you're happy with, is um, to kind of, we can, if we're not gonna look at this stuff up at the top, we can get rid of it. So let's go in here and eliminate the water column then apply that. And then after that, you want to talk about uh, aligning this data with your bathymetry. So when you're in shallow water or you're in relatively flat terrain, you can depend on the bathymetry being better than your sub-bottom data. With sub-bottom data that's collected in a fjord, it's kind of hard to do that because the sub-bottom has such a wide cone that it's seeing data. Um, so here we are on this profile, and as we go down uh, the profile, you can see all these rocks and things. But sometimes when you're, as you keep following along, you'll get to places where the fjord narrows, and even though the bathymetry is flat as a pancake, the sub bottom is actually seeing part of the fjord. And so it's not always um, a good idea to do just a quick uh, datum aligned to your grid. It's good to kind of take a look at what you've got. And we've added a new feature in recent versions of SonarWiz that allow you to display a bathymetric profile across your sub bottom data without actually applying it. So if we go to uh, annotations here, there's a new section here. It says draw grid over uh, as an overlay. So we can change this to like a bright color, I'll make it about four pixels. And here's our grid file that we can apply this to. And now uh, SonarWiz will draw not only the, the profile we traced on our sub bottom data, but it's also gonna lay in where does the bathymetry fall uh, for that same point. So just, it's taking a second here. So here's we move along. Let me slide this over so you can see it. So in blue, that's the actual bathymetry grid. And you can kind of see that the sub bottom was seen or averaging across a wider area here as it climbed up and over the sill. And so the bottom isn't exactly aligned. It's not that it's not aligned, it's just it's incorporating data from outside the trace or outside the track line. The, the bathy is more accurate. But that's an interesting feature that uh, we put in 
in recent versions of SonarWiz. I think this was the last release that came in there. So if you, and, and we know that the, the data was pretty well navigated at the top because the, the sparker is at zero and the receiver is at zero. It's right at the water surface. So with the exception of tides, all of the difference here is just due to the topography and the way the two different sonars see the bottom. So at this point, you're ready to start digitizing your reflectors. And um, I don't think I want to go into too much detail about how that works in SonarWiz, because uh, we have other uh, videos that do that. But I do want to show you some tricks that you can do um, later in the presentation about some new features that we're working on. Uh, but before I do that, uh, there was a request uh, last week to show how do you actually make uh, how do you actually make 3D profiles with sub bottoms. So let's let's just quickly do that while we have everything up here. So what you need to do is enable your 3D view like this, and then you're going to slide over. Uh, here's our bathymetric grid. So we select that, we go to display, and then say display in 3D view. And then you select the sub bottom profiles and do the same thing. So if you like that one in 3D, it's there. Or you can select all of them, go to display. You can do them all at once. And then we can look at, now one of those we've eliminated the water column with the gains. The other two, I haven't done that yet. So that's how to put the profiles into the display. So to summarize, um, in order to, when you're importing uh, sub-bottom data or segway data, you want to be careful uh, that you get everything set up right in the post-process or in the import settings. So if you go to sub-bottom, go to file specific options and go to segway, you, you want to set these guys up and use uh, size C to do that. It's a really easy program. And then when you get it into SonarWiz, pay attention to your sound velocities to make sure that each one of these was correct. Uh, and that's down here, if you select it. It's down here in the sound velocity section here. Then uh, when you are digitizing, you have control over the vertical and horizontal scales. So now you're ready to digitize reflectors. And what I want to do, uh, rather than use uh, existing sonar, was I'm going to switch uh, a project over to um, one that has, oops, that's the wrong one, our yeah, smart reflector tracking. So here I've got a different project, and I have, I'm um, going to load this guy up. And this one has, this is a sparker, so it has kind of easier uh, lines uh, for this demo uh, than, the other, than the other project did. But here is a nice uh, track line that you might, or a nice reflector that you might be interested in digitizing. In the old way Sonar Wiz would work, you would open this up, you give the reflector a name, call this RF1, and you click OK, and then you have to click manually along the track line as your So I click every single time, and then I lift my pen up, and I'm done. Now, what we're working on is a way to make that easier to do. So we have this new thing, so we'll call this RF2. It's called autofill here, or smart reflector tracking. So if you turn this on, we've got some settings here that we're going to put in there. So we'll put a smoothing width of like 10, a uh, snap range of, let's try 10 and point spacing you know, of 10 pings. And now I'm going to set the first point there, and you get a little A. And I'll go to the other side, just kind of the Hail Mary, and just click. And oh, it didn't work. So let's try down here. If we hit the space, this uh, shift key down, we can actually move these lines back down in there. It's not happy. This is still under development. So this one obviously didn't work so hot. Here's another one. 
Let's try this guy. Okay. And we will turn on the autofill again. Now it's doing it. So the purpose of the autofill is just to have try to keep you from having to digitize every single curve. It should try to follow along that for you and fill it in. That that did that worked pretty good. So if you don't like what the autofill picks, you can override it. So if it if it makes a mistake, so here I've done it manually. That was pretty easy. Close this guy. Delete. If autofill makes a mistake, you can just select it and hold down the shift key and fix it. So here I'll put another one in with using autofill. And if it doesn't like it, so this one went way up over there. So let's hold down the shift key and try to get it down. And there I'm, I'm fixing it. So that's how um, this still needs a little more tweaking. The algorithm is being developed um, right now. And we haven't decided on whether these settings here can be automatically set or uh, what kinds of data or track lines it works best with. But our hope is to enable this um, in the next release of SonarOS. We've got a couple months uh, of more tweaking to do. It seems to work really well with um, Sparker data where you have nice lines. It's not so great on uh, bipolar yet, so we'll see if we can get get it working better. Another thing that we've been working on is uh, a way to identify multiples. So I have another project here. Oop. Let me close this. So I was just saying I've locked. I've already got the project open, which is not true. So we're going to open it. Multiples. So this is kind of a uh, a boring track line here. It's a sub bottom profile, so I'll open that up. But it shows off um, a really strong multiple. So here at the surface, uh, we have our tow fish, and then we have the seabed. And then down below, um, let me draw some arrows here. So here's the seabed there, and then it reflects we're seeing the same target again and again as it bounces around in the water column. And in some data sets, being able to identify what is real data and what is a multiple is really important. It's a, and it's kind of tricky to do. So we're trying to come up with a kind of overlay that will allow you to um, work on this. And we have this new button here called multiples. And this is only available in our, uh, our release modes here. So I want a normal pen. So we go here and turn on the multiples. And then we have a series of eight or nine different multiple types that can be identified. Now, the multiples, actually Edge Tech gave us uh, their training materials, has a nice um, little slide that kind of talks about this. Let me get that here. So, First of all, you've got your regular uh, acoustic stuff, your reflections. You've got one that bounces off the surface, so you've got your source, bounces off the surface, then it's on the receiver. Um, and then we've got a normal ping. It goes to the bottom reflection, goes down to the bottom, comes up to the source or the receiver. These are That's what you want to see. What you don't want to see is one of these multiples where it bounces off the surface, bounces off the bottom, bounces off the surface again, then comes back to your receiver. Um, here's another one bounces off the bottom, off the surface, off the bottom, and hits you again. All of these multiples are going to overlay on top of your good data and make it hard to interpret. So here's, a, here's an example of that. So 
we know that everything's up at the surface. So if we turn on, if we want to see, say, the, the surface reflection and the surface multiple one and the surface multiple two, if we put the cursor up at the surface, you can see it's showing us, if I click down here, down, so that he, I try to put the cursor up at the surface and it's identifying this first one as the first multiple of the surface. And then down here, it's the second multiple of the surface. Um, there's different combinations of these. So if we just kept going along, you'd be able to trace out what is what is what. And you can see if you put these markers in there while you're doing digitization, you know that anything that these lines are not real uh, data. They're just reflections or harmonics of stuff you've already seen. So anything below about 20 meters on this data set is suspect. Um, we're still kind of tweaking the interface. Um, there's different types of multiples, some bouncing off the fish itself, some bouncing off the surface and bouncing off the bottom. And uh, the exact uh, user interface that we're trying to develop here is um, still a little bit open-ended. But uh, we're pretty excited about some of this stuff. They're putting a lot of work into this Abata module uh, for our next release. And we've probably got some more cool things coming down the pike that I can't talk about right now. So I think that about covers what um, I have time for today. So we talked a bit about import settings um, and using SciC. The speed of sound in SonarWiz can be a little bit complicated for subbottom because there's multiple places where it's set uh, and they interact with each other. So it's worth uh, spending some time to get that nailed down before you do any digitizing. Then uh, using gains, we talked a bit about how the bandpass filter works and how AGC works. And I got myself into a mess uh, where the AGC can sometimes be too dark and it just hides everything. Uh, so go, it's best to just turn it off, go back to the beginning and reset the settings. Then um, coloring and displaying of bipolar data. If you have positive and negative data, you can control what you're actually looking at and how it's colored. And then, uh, the two, uh, the smart reflector tracking and the multiple identification tool. So those are coming. <clears throat> those aren't available yet in 7.6. They'll be in 7.7 uh, once they're finished uh, with development. So I have a few minutes to uh, answer any questions. If you've typed them in here, let me take a look. I'd like to thank the USGS and EdgeTech for letting us use their slide and for the USGS uh, for their data. First question was, in maps, can you use S57s? And the answer is yes. And that, that appears to be it. So if there's any other qu questions, um, please let us know. You can always contact us through support at support at chesapeake.com or go through our support help desk on the website. So thank you for listening.